Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of City Lights Live, where we continue to celebrate our 70th anniversary in 2023 with a calendar of unique programming. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. Over the course of the last few months, we've been exploring the myriad aspects and threads of history that make up the continuum that is City Lights. Back in October, we staged an event called Found in Translation, Adventures in Language, which celebrated the art of literary translation in regards to City Lights as a publisher. We continue our deep dive into City Lights history tonight. This pro evening's program is called Writers and Musicians in Painterland, City Lights and the Mid-Century Art and Music Explosion. It will explore City Lights role as cultural hub where literature meets art and music. Joining us tonight will be Anastasia Achman, John Bug, John Mathias, Lewis Watts, Laura Whitcomb and Paul Yamazaki, an all-star cast. Before we begin, as is customary, I would like to remind everyone, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples. We would like to take this moment to offer our respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. When thinking about City Lights' as history, I mean, it's easy to try and create a, a linear timeline filling in dates with events such as, uh, say, the meeting of Ferlinghetti with Peter D. Martin or the opening of the store, the emergence of the publishing end, um, the Howell trial and other benchmark events. But in actuality, the City Lights historic trajectory possesses layering of numerous parallel histories, and they're all intertwined. What we have tried to accomplish this evening is bring together a group of individuals uniquely suited to help unravel some of these layers and offer us insight into the ways in which City Lights has served as a cultural hub. Now, City Lights location and unique physical attributes are important factors in its interactions. Within a quarter mile radius of City Lights, since its inception, there has been a rich and diverse variety of different venues and institutions. Their respective audiences and participants have crossed over into the orbit of City Lights and with really many serendipitous and beneficial effects. So in the areas of art and music, I mean, the importance of the proximity of a club and gallery scene and various educational institutions is essential in understanding the connections and cross-pollination that City Lights was to be part of and encourage over the years. The creative interconnectivity we're exploring and must not really be isolated to North Beach alone. I mean, it really does actually stretch across town as well into the Fillmore District and beyond. Professor Lewis Watts is certainly gonna be addressing that in our program. And books themselves, no doubt, also played an important role in this interconnectivity and bringing many into our orbit. And Paul Yamazaki will actually be saying a few things about that. But let's consider for a moment the actual creative hub itself. The infamous jazz workshop was located on Broadway Street within two blocks of City Lights. Keystone Corner, another premier jazz music venue, occupied another space a couple of blocks to the north of City Lights. Today, Key's Jazz Bistro sits on the old location of Vanessi's restaurant. The continuum is in some ways unbroken. Over the years, players have often dropped by the store before or after a set, to browse our stacks or meet up with friends. The Hungry Eye, the Purple Onion, the legendary comedy and music clubs were just down the street on Columbus Avenue. I ask you to imagine the comedian Lenny Bruce dropping by City Lights before a set, picking up a copy of say the New York Times, maybe browsing the stacks in search of material for his routine. And this trajectory continued into the 70s and 80s with the Mabuhay Gardens, which was a Filipino supper club that opened its doors to punk rock and experimental music. In the basement of City Lights, one of the store's staff by the name of V. Vale produced the very first punk rock journal, Search and Destroy. Vale attended many of the concerts at the Mabuhe and even turning on Allen Ginsberg into the existence of the club. Up the street from the Mabuhe was the Delexi Gallery, an outlet for many mid-century artists from Bruce Connor, George Herms, and many others. It too had a special connection to jazz. Its founder, Jim Newman, produced a Sun Ra movie, Space is the Place. In a surprise concert, Sun Ra and his orchestra performed at the Mabuhe Gardens. As tiny as that stage was, they managed to fit the entire group. And really, to the surprise of many in the audience, 
And this offers an interesting example of some of the cross-pollination that we speak of. Uh, many of the players in Sun Ra's orchestra have passed through the doors of City Lights, and City Lights is really one of the most thorough selections of books on jazz in the country, enticing many musicians and jazz aficionados to cross over into its threshold. So I also want to talk a little bit about the existence of the San Francisco Art Institute. It was really to play a profound effect on the history of the store and its publishing operation. Over the years, City Lights has partnered up with various departments at the school, producing some very innovative programs. Many graduates of the Art Institute went on to work at City Lights, and City Lights has featured and collaborated with numerous artists and filmmakers over the years. I mean, the list runs like a who's who of the locals art scene, from the Gashar brothers to Lynn Hirschman, I mean, many others. Um, City Lights even went on to publish Karen Finley's work. Even though the Art Institute is now gone, our collaboration with local partners continues from homespun galleries like the Canessa and Live Worms to more established international galleries like the Wendy Norris. I mean, a symbiotic and complementary relationship has always existed between City Lights and its various cultural partners and the public who frequent them. So we hope tonight to offer you all a glimpse into these slivers of history. It's really impossible to perform an in-depth exploration. I mean, it's really the job of a book or of a film, but we will attempt to offer a kind of a sketch, if you will, offering insight into some of the many mansions that City Lights occupies. So our guest tonight in order of appearance will include the photographer, archivist, and professor emeritus at, of art at UC Santa Cruz, Lewis Watts. He is the co-author of Harlem of the West, the San Francisco Fillmore Jazz Era. Also with us will be Paul Yamazaki, the principal buyer at City Lights and a legendary book trade advocate. Uh, he's been with City Lights for over 45 years. Um, we also have with us John Bug. John Bug is a professor at Fordham University. He is the author of Five Long Winters, The Trials of British Romanticism. He is currently working on a cultural history of City Lights books for the publisher Scribner. Also with us will be John Mathias. He is an artist and art historian, as well as a published poet and former director of the San Jose Center for Poetry and Literature uh, and president of the board of the Triton Museum. He curated the show Lawrence Ferlinghetti, painter, poet, and pacifist. Also with us tonight is Dr. Anastasia Achman. She is an art historian and curator living and working in New York City. She teaches art history at Parsons School of Design and has curated numerous exhibitions. She is the author of the book, Welcome to Painterland, Bruce Connor and the Rat Bastard Protective Association, which was published by University of uh, California Press back in 2016. The title of our event tonight pays tribute to that book. Uh, also joining us will be Laura Whitcomb. Laura is the director of Label Curatorial. Her areas of specialty are mid-century Californian artists, surrealism, the light and space movement, mysticism in 20th century art, and the interdisciplinary crossover between art, music, and literature. She is the author of Delexi, A Gallery and Beyond, exploring Jim Newman's seminal North Beach Gallery and its impact on the Bay Area cultural scene. She is currently completing a new book titled Bay Area Artist and Poet-Run Galleries and Alternative Spaces from 1949 to 1965. City Lights actually comes into play in that book. So please join us in welcoming our guests. Um, I'd like to begin with you, Professor Lewis Watts, to open the program and offer us some historic perspective. As I mentioned earlier, the jazz scene played a huge role in influencing poets and artists, and far before City Lights opened its door and far after, many mid-century artists and poets lived in proximity to the Fillmore District. Uh, Jay DeFeo, Philip Lamantia, Michael McClure lived near Fillmore in Washington. Uh, Kenneth Rexroth's salons used to take place in the Lower Haight. And then, of course, the Sixth Gallery and the East-West Galleries were both located in Fillmore Street, albeit in Cow Hollow, but not far from the bustle of the Fillmore proper. So would you paint a picture for us of the neighborhood and its animated and the lively nature? I will. Okay, so I um, actually moved to San Francisco with uh, after high, graduating from high school in 1964 and uh, spent the summer 
there and said, uh, this is where I want to move, although I didn't, it took me three years to transfer to Berkeley. But when I was there, someone said, do you want to go to the black area of San Francisco? And I knew nothing about it, but someone took me to Filmer on a Friday night and it was jumping. People were dressed to the nines. It was wall to wall. It was like, I'll never forget it. It was pretty amazing. And so when I transferred to Berkeley in 1968, um, I went back looking for it and couldn't find it because it had been erased. Hmm. Um, so the the history of it is that um, it was the Western Edition was actually one of the more diverse areas of San Francisco is where the second synagogue was. They what eventually became um, People's Temple. Um, it was also where there was a large Japanese population um, that had been there since the twenties. And after Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese were um, uh, forced to close their businesses and leave um, uh, leave town, actually be go to the concentration camps. And at the same time, the shipyards up and down the West Coast needed workers because they were um, uh, shifting for the war effort. And so people from all over the country came West, but especially in, the, in California, people came from Louisiana and Texas, especially. And in San Francisco, uh, it was there was both restrictions and also not limited housing, and so the only place where there's available housing was actually in the the Fillmore District, the Western Edition, um, and the Western Edition actually had been an entertainment center. It was actually where after the San Francisco earthquake, a lot of the um, uh, businesses moved from downtown to that area, and. Um, uh, they uh, it then had a number of clubs and um, uh, places. So when people arrived from the South, um, they brought with them their musical tastes. Um, the, a lot of the churches converted. And almost immediately, there were seven, eight, ten clubs that regularly had uh, jazz and in some cases, um, rhythm and blues. And, um, uh, and, and an audience to go. This is actually a picture taken at the Booker T. Washington Hotel in the early 50s. And if you look, uh, the woman on the uh, left is Ella Fitzgerald. And what I love this picture for a number of reasons. A, you can see um, next to her is um, uh, little Joe um, Turner, who was a character who I saw in a lot of pictures um, and who kept putting me off because I wanted to, to interview him, and he finally passed before I could do it. But next to him is Don Newcomb, who was a bitch, pitcher for the Brooklyn and then Los Angeles Dodgers, and next to him is Joe the Jet Perry for the 49ers. And then you can see there's, uh, um, and then I love the guy on the right has these really great Argyle socks, and this <laughs> is in the basement of the Booker T. Washington Hotel. So this, in one case, is um, a number of people would come to perform in San Francisco, and uh, uh, Black folks were not allowed to stay in some of the hotels and venues, so they would come and stay in the Fillmore, and um, a, a lot of times would go to after-hours places after they had gigged, and this was also a gathering place. So um, here's a picture of Billie Holiday and Mel Torme, um, and an unknown gentleman. I love that when Billie Holiday had a Chihuahua, when the Chihuahua died, she had the the dog dog buried with her mink. One of my Billie Holiday stories. Um, here's Lionel Hampton with um, Charles Sullivan, who actually was the owner of the Filmer Auditorium uh, during that time, and he um, had connections and actually did promotion all over the West Coast. Um, and uh, I think, and then next to him is um, oh, I'm not even thinking name, but you see Lionel Hampton in the middle. But um, there are a number of other folks that people know. Somebody may be able to recognize them. My mind is not clear. Um, but what was interesting that when um, uh, Bill Graham was working for the Mime Troop and uh, needed a place to do a benefit, because some of the Mime Troop were accused of um, uh, being uh, not being American. And so uh, he was able to, to uh, make arrangements with Charles to use the film on a day when he wasn't didn't have a gig. And a whole bunch of people showed up and that kind of started um, a whole kind of phenomenon. Actually, Charles, Charles Sullivan was killed uh, not too soon after that, not too far after that. And Bill Graham took over the Fillmore and sort of the rest is history. He sort of started a uh, empire across the country. 
So one of the clubs, one of the after hours clubs was a place called Jimbo's Bop City. There was actually a Bop. I think the Jimbo's was the first one was in the Bay Area, but there was a Bop City in New York also. And it was actually originally a, um, a Waffle House. Um, but eventually Jimbo, um, I, I think someone talked him into putting a rhythm section of a, a um, uh, bass and dr drums. And so musicians who were playing in the in the in town would come after hours um, and gig and it became um, sort of the place to go. Um, and uh, you can see that it was it was actually on Sutter. And uh, eventually it got moved to Fillmore around the corner, actually, well, during redevelopment, the, the club had already closed, but it became Marcus Books at that time. So the, most of the pictures were um, in black and white. And in fact, a lot of the clubs hired photographers. Um, and so I was able, so eventually I found a, a, a cache of, of images and then was able to find some of the other photographers. Some people know David Johnson, who's 97, um, who had a, what was the first uh, African-American to study with Ansel Adams at the Art Institute and had a studio in the Fillmore and has sort of been rediscovered um, by the book. He's doing quite well now. He's in the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. Um, but this is kind of what the, the back room looked like and it became a place to go. And the other thing was musicians would have their names uh, written on the backs of chairs and then they would be reserved for them when they came. And I think it was a place you can see where um, uh, people from all over town came. And some people liked that and some people did not like that. They did not like the fact that it was integrated. Um, but I think it was interesting to see. You can sort of see, um, A, the kind of style of the 50s and uh, 60s. Um, although even when it started, um, there were some people downtown that, A, were saying that this community is filled with Victorians and they're rat traps and we really need to modernize. And so there was plans afoot. Um, and by, like I said, by the time I got there in 68, a lot of the buildings had been torn down and a lot of the people were displaced, put on a list where they were supposed to come back. And I think about one or two families actually were able to relocate. Here's Duke Ellington being really uh, charming. <laughs> Actually, it was interesting that you could sit in and the, the musician on the right with a sort of glassy eyed has just been asked to leave. If you couldn't play, you were, they would, you know, um, ask you in no uncertain terms to uh, go. It's Teddy Edwards in the middle with his girlfriend, and an admirer, he was doing all right. Here's a picture of Jimbo. Uh, people, the bass players I know said the, the house bass was terrible, so they were always bringing their own basses. This is Paul Gonzalez um, jamming with Duke Ellington's orchestra. Um, here's the, and you know this would go on until six or seven in the morning. You can sort of see it feels like that late. And some people would go to the Fillmore on Friday night and just party until Sunday, just nonstop. It really was a pretty incredible. And uh, I love this picture because uh, she must have been really good because it was not, it was very difficult for women to, to be able to sit in. Although during World War II, there were all kinds of uh, all women orchestras because a lot of the soldiers were not available. Here's Jimbo's again. You see a poster for K Jazz, which existed then. So, um, like I said, here's Herb Kane hanging out with uh, Jimbo. Let's see. Um, somebody, I'll admit if I can do it. Let's see. I can't seem to, someone wants to enter, but I can't seem to do it while the, the uh, slideshow is going, but I'll, I'll let her in in a minute. Here's Louis Armstrong um, in front of a poster at Jimbo's of him. And here's a young Johnny Mathis who uh, grew up in San Francisco and actually was a track and field star and then eventually became a uh, entertainer as everybody knows. And it really was a place to hang out. I think uh, the Rat Pack, here's Sammy Davis playing bongos um, in one of the after hours places at, at Jimbo's actually. Here's a picture of Charlie Parker. Um, 
so it was, you know, the, it, when people were passing through in the West Coast, this was always a place to come. So I'll, I'll do a little bit of this. So we also found these pictures by the Redevelopment Agency, and you can see that the buildings have been marked. And so they were actually um, collecting, kind of doing a survey of the buildings. And a lot of these spaces were ended up being torn down. Um, and, and although what happened actually after that happened was um, the idea of architectural preservation uh, began because, um, you know, they were basically just without thinking about whether the, the space had historical um, uh, value or aesthetic value. Um, and so uh, that idea of them having to pass muster before they were going to be destroyed actually came from um, this process. I remember um, finally finding the neighborhood and uh, literally it looked like a war zone. What happened was in the middle of this process, people, activists from the community stopped it um, with the idea that they could have a hand in the redevelopment. And so there were actually empty lots for many years. And there was some effort eventually to um, at least make a jazz preservation district out of it, um, which sort of only partially succeeded. Um, Yoshi's opened there for a little while, and there were a couple, there were clubs, uh, other clubs, but because they didn't have the critical mass and an audience, um, they were not able to survive. The other thing that's interesting, I was just on a tour of the migration, California Migration Museum that has a audio guided tour because Japantown did, um, uh, the Japanese came back and in some cases, um, I hope I, uh, there's a picture, I don't know if I have it here, but there's a picture of a Japanese wedding with a, um, a lot of black folks in the wedding party. So people, there were some obviously uh, adjustments. This is a picture of John Handy, who's still playing um, and lives in the East Bay, but was a, a San Francisco resident for many years. Here he is now in front of. So we were able to put posters and things on the uh, walls, and then the, eventually the book came out. Um, and here's a picture taken at Jimbo's with John Handy uh, on the left, Pointy Point Dexter, a very young John Coltrane, and Frank Fisher, who actually is a lives in Richmond near me, and he actually just retired. But I showed, I gave this picture to Alice Coltrane, and she said that was the youngest picture she'd ever seen him as as a musician. Um, and and I actually gave it to his uh, John's son Robbie, and he said he wished he had that uh, axe, he wished he had the saxophone. So this was the first edition of the book, Harlem of the West, published by Chronicle Books. Um, they did a couple of editions. Um, and in the early 2000s, when publishing was getting funky, they sort of panicked because um, whenever we'd have events or show work, the book would sell very well, but it had slowed down. So and um, what we were not absolutely happy with it, um, although I'm going to approach them again, well, maybe I'll be doing it, but um, they decided to do this tent and it actually sort of um, ruined the um, some of the the uh, quality of the images. So um, we were able to raise some money and, and actually a number of people who would not speak to us because they literally people had been really um, uh, had to move and, and not treated very well. And so they were very suspicious of people, but they really loved the book. And so we got more, um, uh, we were able to add more uh, images and um, we, re we published it ourselves. And then eventually in 2000 and um, uh, what was it? Something like 2012, Haiti Books in Berkeley uh, uh, published the latest edition. It just went out of print. And we're at some point, we're going to work on um, doing it again. And I may be calling on you at City Lights to help us raise money to do that. Well, I think that's, and we've had been able to have a number of um, uh, concerts. In fact, here's the two of the people on that, um, the cover. That's John, John Handy and Frank Fisher at a, a gig that we did uh, when the book first came out, actually. And you can see sort of examples of um, how the the book is laid out. And actually, it's interesting. This was on Fillmore Street uh, for a while, and there was an older uh, gentleman there. And I came and asked him, I said, so what do you think of this? And he says, I live not too far from here. A lot of people move to the Haight and to Daly City and to the East Bay and to Hunter's Point. But he lived too, not too far away. And he said, I come here every day because it reminds me of the best time of my life. And I, I believe in it. it was, it's, so I was, uh, this is kind of one of those things where I keep thinking maybe I'm done with this because the book's out of print, but 
Uh, I'm not. And uh, things keep coming up. People are doing films about it. Uh, I use the images for um, um, exhibits. I was able, there's a um, the Booker T. Washington Senior Citizens Senior Citizens um, Centers in the neighborhood, and we had an exhibit at a gallery. And a lot of the people who had lived in the time were able to add more to the story. So there's always, and every, whenever we show the work, someone would say, "Oh, that's my auntie, or that's my grandparents." So, and um, the, you know, the other offshoot of this is that a lot of the people that have been displaced joined Jim Jones's um, People's Temple as a way to kind of reconnect with the community. And um, when he, they were both very happy to do that, but also vulnerable, and I think really got exploited by him, and a lot of them ended up dying in uh, Jonestown. I think that's probably, let's see if there's, this is actually, so this is Marcus Books that unfortunately is no longer uh, um there, but this is the building that was Jimbo's and it, rather than being uh, torn down, it was moved around the corner to Fillmore Street. So there's sort of some connection. And this is uh, some of the exhibits. Let's see, I think we are done. It's also shown in Los Angeles and a couple of other places. So um, it, is, it has a life that continues and it really is a reflection. I was gonna, oh, the other thing I was gonna say, it was also, I know Jack Kerouac talks about visiting the Fillmore and going to Jimbo's Bob City. Um, and it was sort of a place, um, probably because it was, uh, there was a certain toleration that um, uh, a variety of people in the, from the counterculture, the counterculture kind of started there, um, felt welcome there and felt safe there. So I will, let's see if I can get this, make this disappear, uh, do this, let's see. Thank you, Lewis. That was that was fantastic. You know, I, I, when you mentioned uh, the the best days of um, his life, it reminded me of something that that Ruth Weiss once told me. We were talking about the '40s and '50s, and, mm -hmm. and she said, like, you know, that some of those parties just went on all night long. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there were there were it, there was jazz, but then sometimes people would get up and read. And oh yeah, uh, no, absolutely, no, they would yeah. absolutely. And sometimes some people just open their houses. And uh, just let people come in the party like that would be the after after party where you just sort of hang out. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. And it, and it is, um, you know, there's I have I've yet to meet someone who was not it, it sort of degenerated a little bit toward the end. But it was at, this hey, at its heyday. It was really amazing. Yeah, thank you. All. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for painting that beautiful picture. I want to bring Paul Yamazaki into our discussion now because. Paul, I'd like to add to, to Lewis's train of thought, because, you know, you've also produced the Asian Jazz Festival. You've been in the orbit of Kearney Street Writers Workshop, which is down the street from City Lights in Manila Town. I mean, there's been a very definite crossover between writers and musicians that continues to this day. Um, if you could talk a little bit about City Lights as a hub, but also uh, Shig Morao, who is the store's manager, who is um, Japanese-American, uh, uh, also, the importance of books in all of this. Um, yes, so Lewis gave, Dr. Watts gave us a perfect intro, kind of segue into there with like closing with Jimbo's building, moving over to Fillmore Street and Marcus being in that thing. So, and, and then Tony Poindexter being on the cover of the first edition of Harlem of the West. So, Marcus Books used to be over on McAllister Street, a little bit west of Van Ness, and it's uh, Mr. Richardson. The Richardsons were the owners of the store. Blanche Richardson still runs Marcus in Oakland today, but it's he was such an influence on me personally and, uh, and what City Lights, but he introduced me to Pony Point Dexter. Pony had a book uh, called Pony Express uh, that he published himself and that uh, and once I found and bought that book at Marcus um, and was introduced to Pony, I asked him to come to City Lights and uh, would he sell some books on consignment? I couldn't pay him for something, but we'd, we would sell the books and we would pay him for whatever we sold. And so every now and then he would come by and I would keep tally of that and said, well, we owe you X amount of dollars and could you bring a few more copies in? And it's, it's uh... but the other connection to Jimbo's was Gerald Oshta, who played with everybody and recorded with everybody from Roscoe Mitchell to Michael Bloomfield, actually used as a young as a young person, just coming back from camps after the war, 
would be in the basement underneath Jimbo's listening to these after hour sessions. His his friend, there was a grocery store that was immediately adjacent and their storage room was in the basement under there. And they were right underneath the, the basement of, of, uh, of where the stage was at Jimbo's. And so Gerald grew up listening, like, you know, sneaking out of his house, going to his friend's place and then, uh, and just kind of for hours being wrapped there. And so G, as we called him, just um, not only was he known as a, as a tremendous instrumentalist, he was also a repair and restore and collector of arcane saxophone. So Rassan would come, to, Rassan Roland Kirk would come to him to uh, repair his instruments. Uh, Anthony Braxton with his counterbass sarusophones, who Gerald was literally the only person in the world who could like repair and restore these instruments. And it's, it's, um, but all these things come back and forth. And so like, you know, when Todd opens up Keystone, um, I was incredibly fortunate that, you know, that city, San Francisco was the kind of city was, I would be a young person who would stand huddled in the door in the doorway. So if you were ever in the Keystone, there's a sound stage and there's two doors. One was the major entrance and then another was just a, a kind of side entrance near the sound stage. And I would sit there or stand there just kind of night after night. And they finally got used to seeing me and they let me slide on the second sets. And it's uh, but to be able to go there and to see like, you know, Max Roach with his quintet paired with Johnny Griffin and his quintet, or like one of the most remarkable double bills was Cecil Taylor's solo with Randy Weston's solo. And so I used to do Saturday nights at City Lights. And so it was always thrilling because Archie would come, Archie Shep would, would come in on kind of on a regular basis between his set, Cecil was also in, Max would come in. And so North Beach just became a place where a lot of musicians would come. And so as younger musicians, Todd Barkin, who was the owner and, and booked all these things, just was so open to music jazz of all types and 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 he was also very improvisational how he booked so if somebody like Leroy Jenkins with the revolutionary ensemble was coming back from Japan for such he would call Todd up says like we have this Monday night free and Todd would say like yeah let's see what we can find and then it's uh and so they would end up hanging out I would be fortunate to kind of like with Leroy with James Newton uh, with Anthony Brown be able to kind of like you know talk music and books and so and that tradition carries on and it's uh, with the reopening of keys. But it's all these things tie up together. And we'll hear more about like Jim Newman later, who like with Walter Hopps were producing jazz concerts in the early 50s at Stanford. And they went on to do that Oberlin. So I will leave it there and just kind of I'm fascinated to hear what everybody else has to say. But thank you, Peter. Paul, could you talk a little bit about Shig Morale? Shig? Yes, so Shig was like, if City Lights has an aura today, the bookstore, I think Shig was the person who created that. And that's, he's a Japanese American, Nisei, uh, born in Seattle. Like so many Japanese Americans of his generation were in concentration camps for anywhere from a year to four years. Uh, I don't know how long, but Shig was a rebel. He came to, North Beach, and he just uh, within a year after Peter and Peter and Lawrence and Peter Martin opened the store and quickly became essential to City Lights and essential to Lawrence. And he was actually the person who was arrested for selling Howell. He was when the police came in, and you know, Lawrence was subsequently kind of issued a warrant and arrested. But um, I think it's safe to say that. Shig's presence there as a Japanese American, as an Asian American, was a visual representation that made for so many artists and, and people who grew up in Chinatown uh, that City Lights was also 
part of their community and that the chic made it a place where they could go. So like, you know, whether it was Frank Chin or Jessica Hagedorn or Maxine Honk Kingston, just so many writers of color would see Shig's presence there and say, well, this is, this is a place where it's broad representation of American culture, not just a narrow slice of American culture. And I think that's what we can try to continue on today. Thank you, Paul. That's 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 yeah. fantastic. Uh, I want to bring John Bug into the discussion. John, you're working on a book about City Lights. You've been going through large amounts of, of archival data. So please paint a picture for us from your unique point of view regarding City Lights as a cultural hub. What are the qualities that really allow for a place like this? Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, so um... I guess maybe I'll I'll pick up where, where Paul left off because I think one of the qualities was Shig um that that made a, a place like this possible. I was just um writing a little bit about when uh Ginsburg arrived in San Francisco uh before Howell. So he has a manuscript of his collection called Empty Mirror that he's trying to uh uh shop around a little bit, uh gives it to Rex Roth, seeing if Rex Roth can give it to somebody at New Directions. Uh, and then he comes to he comes to City Lights because he hears about you know that he knows about the Pocket Poet series, and he he asked Ferlinghetti if he can be included in the Pocket Poet series, and and Ferlinghetti looked at an Empty Mirror, um, and wasn't quite sure. There was you know by this time this was the summer of 1955. There was already this sort of like centripetal movement of uh, poets from across the Bay Area into City Lights. Um, Ferlinghetti himself said, like, bookshops are a natural gathering place for poets. And so then when the Pocket Poets series starts up, that's when the centrifugal movement starts. And then that just creates a cycle as those books go out, uh, more people start hanging out. Um, and so that's when you get like a 29 year old um, confused Columbia grad uh, coming into City Lights with his manuscript for Empty Mirror. Um, and, you know, I think it 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 matters um that shig was there so ginsburg was uh, uh during one of his suspensions from columbia he was a clerk at uh, gotham book mart um and i don't know if that helped uh him and shig to hit it off but they became good friends and uh some of this is lost to history but um I, once the letters pick up it does seem like ginsburg's relationship to city lights um i think shig had a, a big role in that um especially the sort of long history of that relationship um Paul talked about Shig's uh, aura still being there. And, you know, I you, you can even sort of think of that in terms of um, some of the book, book history of City Lights, even after even after Shig left. Um, so but but, you know, thinking about um, City Lights as um, a hub for artists in the early years, it was sort of, it was an interesting way to, to think about this because we, you know, tend to go automatically um, in those early years to the poets and the beats and that kind of thing. Um, so City Lights as a, as, as a hub for artists, it's, you know, it's one way that we can kind of piece this together is that Ferlinghetti placed little, little tiny notices in the, in the Chronicle, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, um, advertising um, the exhibitions at City Lights. Uh, so this, you know, very quick prehistory when Ferlinghetti was in Paris, um, doing his uh, PhD at the Sorbonne in the late 40s. Um, he really enjoyed some of the, the bookshops there, like Le Hune, um, uh, Le Pont Traversé, these, these bookshops that also functioned as art galleries. Um, Le Pont Traversé, the, the, the bookshop owner, Marcel Beaulieu, put up his own surrealist paintings around the bookshop. Um, and Ferlinghetti writes about enjoying the exhibitions at Le Hune. So when he gets back to... Um, San Francisco, he starts putting on exhibitions uh, when he found City Lights, starts putting on exhibitions. And some of the names are familiar to us, um, some may be less familiar. So the first artist exhibited at City Lights um, was a guy named Henry Marie Rose, who was from Martinique. Um, then he spent eight years studying in Paris, studying art on the left bank. Uh, at the same time, Ferlinghetti was there. I don't know if they crossed paths there, but um, by 55, uh, his, his works were on exhibition at City Lights. Um, one quick note about Marie Rose, one of his sculptures is still visible um, on the, the outside uh, facade of the um, Samson Street Firehouse today. Um, other artists who were there, Henry Riddell's photos, um, some block prints by Mel Fowler, these are all in 55. 
Um, before his death, Weldon Keyes did a, a showing of some of his paintings mm -hmm. um, there. Um, but I wanted to sort of change gears and tell a slightly different story of the meeting of literature and art at City Lights in these early years. And this has to do with what was City Lights' first uh, window display. Um, and so this uh, comes in the summer of, of 1954. And in particular, it's tied to a, a, a specific work of art that was on, on display. Um, maybe a slightly surprising story, but um, so right around maybe the one year anniversary of City Lights opening, um, they started to have uh, author readings and, and author signings, which was uh, relatively rare at the time, but these were really popular. A lot of people came to them. They held them on Saturday afternoons. And um, the first, so the first ever author to do a book signing at City Lights was a guy named Raymond Mason. And he was a, um, uh, a pulp writer. So he, he uh, did a signing of his book and Two Shall Meet. This was a, um, a sort of pulp paperback uh, that was put out by, it was Signet Books, but they had this line called Gold Medal Edition. And these were sort of pulp originals. They had a little red strap at the bottom that said original, uh, not reprint. Uh, so these were not reprinted paperbacks. And so they did a, they did a signing with, with Mason. And one of the interesting things about the gold medal paperbacks is when you open them and you look on the, the inside, the inside title page, it says the name of the author, and it says the name of the artist who made the cover painting for the novel. Um, and so it was one of these paintings um, that led to the first ever window display at City Lights. Um, so this was uh, this was a couple weeks later. This was um, July 31st, 1954. And the author's name uh, was William Brothers. And um, his book is called Portrait of Lisa. And I'm just going to show you uh, the cover, first of all, of this book. Um, and then I'll show you a picture of the uh, the actual window display that they made. So um, I hope you all can see this. Um, so this is um, the, the painting that um, the artist made for Portrait of Lisa. This was an artist named uh, Ray Johnson. Confusingly, not the Ray Johnson, the avant-garde artist from New York. This was somebody named Ray Sven Johnson. Um, I finally found an article about this guy, and the author started by saying that he is the mystery man in pulp covers because we can't find out anything about him. Uh, but what we do know is he painted about 500 of these um, paintings for Avon Modern Library and uh, Golden Medal. Um, and so uh, it was this book with William P. Brothers uh, there in person that uh, was the occasion for the first window display. And I'm going to show you that next. Let me just call this up here. Okay. Yeah, so this, I um, hope you all can make this out. This is the first um, ever window display at City Lights. And um, this, so you can see the, the, the painting that we saw on the cover in the last image. Here it is here. And these paintings were about, um, I think they're usually about 30 inches high by about 24 inches wide, something like that. They were quite big, um, usually acrylic or gauche. And um, we see here that they made a kind of noir um, sort of set for the window display. So uh, they put an Underwood typewriter here. We have some uh, an ashtray with some cigarettes jabbed out and uh, there's a page. I can't make out the writing on the page, unfortunately. Um, uh, and then there is uh, a, an image, uh, a letter here that says, come in for drinks um, and to meet the author, uh, Brothers, the author of the portrait, uh, portrait of Lisa. Um, and this image we're looking in from the outside, obviously. This is um, Brothers here. Um, uh, this is, uh, these are two reporters, I think, who are covering the event. Can't quite make out the other people, although I, in the back, in sort of hazy in the background, although I have some, some guesses who they might be. Um, and so this is, uh, I thought this would be a, an interesting thing to bring to the conversation because, you know, in a lot of the names that um, are associated with City Lights um, went on to uh, sort of fantastic success. It was almost like if you cross through this hub, um, and came out the other side, um, you were going to be remembered. But there is this, this sort of weird moment in the summer of 54 
um, when uh, Ferlinghetti and Martin uh, were having great success with these pulp events and uh, a name like Ray Sven Johnson and William P. Brothers um, are sort of lost in the in the history of city or the history of American culture, frankly. Um, and so it's sort of interesting to bring these back and see that uh, Martin and Ferlinghetti were really interested in bringing in popular works to the shop um, uh, and not just um, some of the more highbrow paperbacks that they were also publishing. Um, so maybe I'll uh, stop sharing here. Maybe I'll, I'll finish up there, Peter, and, and throw it back to you. Well, thank you so much for that. That that was a great little tidbit of of kind of hitherto unknown City Lights history. Um, I think no discussion of, of, of City Lights as a cultural hub would be possible without really invoking the influence of Lawrence, our founder. Um, and John Mathias, um, if you could really talk about Ferlinghetti as painter and how that outlook affected City Lights, um, thinking about his trajectory as an artist and how it might have crossed over into his writing. I mean, text appears in a lot of his paintings. And I think this is this is really significant. John, uh, let yes. me see if I can. Yeah, you're muted. If you could unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Let's just move that aside. If you could put up the first slide. Yeah. Just give me a moment here. So one of the things about being a curator at the uh, Trite Museum is that often when people would come in and, and look at Pearl and Getty's work, they would begin by saying, I didn't know he was a painter. So I've got a simple goal right now today, and that is that I'm not going to talk about the things that we think we know about Lawrence. I'm not going to talk about the poet or or the bookstores or the Howl. I'm just going to talk about when Mr. Ferlinghetti comes to San Francisco. And when he came here in 1951, his name was Mr. Ferling. The first job he had here was working for Art Digest magazine, which was one of the most important art magazines in the United States coming out of New York City. And he also at the time rented a painting studio from Hassel Smith. And Hassel Smith was teaching at the San Francisco Art Institute. And this was an opportunity for him to meet the different artists like Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, Mark Toby, and Morris Graves. So immediately, even before the writing, he was included in and part of being the painting scene. Next slide. This is a slide. So we know that he's a critic for Art Digest. And one of the artists that came to the Oakland Museum is Henri Michaud. And Henri was not only a painter, but he was also a poet. And at the time, most of the people that Lawrence knew were either writers on the one side or they were painters on the other side. And in the early years, they didn't mix. Henri Michou was someone who uh, did both. He gave Lawrence permission to do both, but he also gave Lawrence permission to move the language and the words around the poetry page in the same way that maybe he would move um, the color to his paintings. You can see some of the paintings at the side there. They're very um, abstract, maybe even writerly-like, but to be able to move those really helped Lawrence to feel comfortable moving his words around. Next slide. So where did Lawrence's paintings come from? He did begin painting when he was at the Sorbonne, but when he was at Columbia getting his master's degree, he wrote about Ruskin, a critic, who was writing about the paintings of uh, Turner, of J.M.W. Turner. So this is Snowstorm, Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps. When you see Turner's paintings going forward, you'll realize that Turner was never painting an army crossing the Alps. In fact, what he was painting was light, which we'll find out that Ferlin Getty does in the future. Um, it does these layers of transparencies to build it up. And in the future, you'll see that he just literally, Turner does cut off the bottom 25% of the painting. The next one, please. So here I want to see that this is called Birds Taking Flight. This is a painting by Lawrence. It's um, 12 feet by 16 feet large. It's incredibly bold. If you look at the paint layers, you can see where some of the influence is coming from the Turner paintings or coming from the critiques of the Turner paintings. But I think more importantly, you begin to see the different areas of light. And light became a fascination with Ferlinghetti for his whole career. Um, this is one of the paintings that when we brought down 
the poet laureates from Santa Clara County and from San Francisco, we found that this painting was large enough that if you stood in front of it, it made for an incredible backdrop, backdrop especially if you were someone who used a lot of gestures because your hands would start to be like the birds leaving the earth at the same time. Next slide. Just a moment. Okay, this is two slides I wanted to put together, or two pictures I wanted to put together. And quickly on Lawrence's life, Lawrence was a submarine chaser. That was the 105 foot boat that he was on during World War II. And one of the things about being a submarine chaser is you're only about 10 feet off the ground. If you're on an aircraft carrier, you're gonna be about 100 feet off the ground. And therefore your relationship with the boat is really your relationship with the air. You're not near the water. In this case, he was only about 10 feet from the water and his relationship was with the water. Now, Furlan Getty had one of the most difficult childhoods of any person that I had ever known or heard of, with the exception of people trying to cross the border and walking from Venezuela. Um, but he was the youngest of five boys. His father died when, when he was in his mother's womb. His mother ended up going to the New York State Hospital uh, when he was very young. And so I am assuming, although I don't know for sure, but I believe this to be his family. And one of the things that I feel about Berlin Getty's work, next slide, please, is that Lawrence, in much of his life, even coming to San Francisco, even his childhood, showed that he was adrift in what he was doing. I don't know who the gag person is. I don't know who the, blind person, the blindfolded person is, but I do know that this is a boat without a sail, without a rudder, and I think the most amazing thing about this piece is not just the boat and the people in the boat, but if you look at the water, as you have all of the white caps and the waves, all of those are just souls that are floating through the water in their own time and space. Um, incredible piece, and if you look really deep in that, which you're not gonna see on the slide, you'll see there are some words that had been painted over as if he wanted to tell his story and then paint over them with these different souls. I might say that I believe this is a piece that the Triton Museum had to send to uh, Parsons School of Design. And if you wanna give it back to us, we'll take it any day of the week. It's one of my favorites of Lawrence's pieces. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a simple piece, but I'm showing this piece because Lawrence really was restrained in his use of color. It's pretty much a black and white painting there's a little bit of red on the beak. But the thing that amused me most is that in Lawrence's pieces, he's extremely direct with what he wants to say. And he also knows that we don't know what the hell he's talking about at all. And the reason I say that is I had pulled up two different um, newspaper critics on this piece. And one of the person said, oh, this is obviously an eagle that has come down and to save the world from war. And in the other critique, it said, oh, this is obviously a vulture, and the vulture is showing us what war is all about. And so when I look, look at, at Lawrence's pieces, I think, thank God you're telling us exactly what you want us to hear, and this is exactly what we don't know that you're saying. Which reminds me a lot of his poems, because his poems tend to be very visual, and his paintings tend to be very lyrical, and you're not exactly sure which one is which as you're reading them or seeing them. Um, this painting, by the way, is probably six feet by nine. So most of his paintings that we had in the show, at least half of the 50, were really large paintings. And it shows me that the boldness of the stroke, because he's moving in this and he's showing the strength of his arm, he's showing the transparency up high where it's beginning, the oil is beginning to drop down and the drips on the paint. It's showing me a lot of um, strength and understanding of his medium in this painting. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide called Liberty. And again, I wanna go back to the themes of his work because in this slide, you have the boat, you have the water, you have the figure, you have the blindfold. The blindfold is going in a direction where you don't know where he's going. And then you have the Statue of Liberty. And Lawrence did quite a few paintings of the Statue of Liberty um, and some facial sculptures or animated pieces of that. But this to me is one of the more sophisticated pieces in his use of color and in his use of light. And then also telling the story that you don't know 
where this is going. Next slide, please. So whatever the, the slide of liberty was, this is the slide that's exactly the opposite of that. This is the Third World War. It's less about the paint. It's more about the composition. It's more about the pure energy. It's more about the statement. I might say at this point that Lawrence might have been a predecessor to some of the graffiti artists because he was never afraid to mix words into his paintings, and he was never afraid to mix paintings into um, his poems. This is one I would say visually. It probably doesn't work aesthetically for me, but I certainly get the point. And if you look at City Lights, when you look at the banners up there, I think democracy is not a spectator sport. I mean, Lawrence to me is just um, a superb artist because you don't know if he ever was not living inside his art space. I think if he sat down and had sushi and he saw a bottle of ketchup or something, he would take that moment in that time and just say, oh, I've never tried this. Let's try this. <laughs> next, next slide. Okay, I want to back off a little bit on this, and that is we know that Jack Kerouac did write his book, Big Sur, and he did write it down beneath the Bixby Bridge. That's the... Uh, the acres, the five acres that Lawrence had. When Kerouac wrote the book, he came in on a taxi cab and evidently he was quite drunk and it was quite dark at night. And he had to walk down the, uh, the whole hill from the, from the roadway down to the cabin. And unfortunately he didn't make it to the cabin. He fell asleep before that. But I think it's important as a legacy for Lawrence, at least it is for me because I'm a writer because I read Lawrence early in my career, is that he continues something like this, and I hope that Lorenzo can make this into a museum or an Airbnb or at least have a poetry symposium down at the, uh, the West Hotel. By the way, there's a great restaurant right on the edge of this, of the restaurant. So if you ever go down there, stop at the restaurant and go down the Bixby Bridge. Next slide. This was the show that he had at the Triton Museum of Art. And you can see there's a lot of words or a lot of text on the paintings. There were about 50 pieces in that show. It was one of the largest shows that he had had in the United States. And the Triton Museum has become the largest owner of his major paintings. I know in, at the University of Santa Cruz, Rita Bottoms has a lot of his smaller paper paintings, but we have the largest of his canvas paintings. And some of them are just incredibly bold, incredibly large and I would love to lend them to other museums. Next slide. Um, Lawrence was one of the early people at Hunters Point Shipyard. I haven't been able to find anyone that has told me when he started his studio here at Hunters Point, but it was my understanding that he was actually one of the early negotiators to get that space. It is the shipyard that was owned by the Naval Department. It is on a super fund. I think it's important that we allow our artists to work on super funds because there's no loss, no gain there. I also think it's important that at an artist studio, they have a little uh, guard stand outside. So before you go into the studio, you have to sign in. Um, it's one thing for painters to have a guard sign. I think poets should probably have an armed guard outside of there. <laughs> I did ask Diane Roby about how it was to be living on a super fund. And she said to me, Bluntly, are you afraid of living or afraid of dying? Because you know that Lawrence lived to be 101 years old. So next slide. And this was the inside of his studio. He was, he was prolific in his paintings, but he was also simple in the fact that here it is, you know, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the hero to many people, the, the head of the beats or not. But all he did to put his name on the studio door is to rip off a piece of cardboard and write his name on it, tack it on the door. His paintings are there. The next slide is of a panoramic of his studio, which again shows a lot of the paintings over on the one side and as we were picking them for the museum show. And then I think probably the one piece that, well, the white piece and the black piece with the big circle that was one of the last paintings he did, and he was 98 years old when he did that. And he was losing his sight, so there wasn't a lot of color in it. But if you look at the brush strokes with the big circles, he still had the open motion and the open movement that you might look at as Zen movement. And then the next slide is kind of what I think of, of Lawrence. It's just 
fuck art, baby. Let's just dance the night away. And this is us going forward. Thank you. That's that's it. Thank you. Wow, thank you so very much for, for that. Um, really rarefied, wonderful, wonderful kind of view into Lawrence as painter. Uh, I'd like to welcome now Anastasia Ackman to say a few words about the importance and interconnection between the beats and mid-century artists, Bruce Connor, George Herms, Wallace Berman. They were all in the orbit of City Lights. I mean, City Lights was one of the only places one could pick up a copy of Semina Journal. Uh, George Herms worked at City Lights for a period of time. Um, but, you know, Bruce Connor, I have to say, over the years, has kind of been in, in and out of our orbit. Anastasia, welcome. Um, thanks so much to everyone. I I, um, I look forward to Laura's presentation after mine. But so far, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just so stimulated by um, what everyone has had to say and offer. And uh, John, I will... Um, I will see if I can get a drift back to you. Uh, <laughs> I will, uh, to be continued. We'll, well see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's standing in the way, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I decided I would begin with, um, I, I'm st I'm struck by the fact that uh, 1953 is sort of a um, a big year. It's the year that Frill and Kenny uh, opens uh, City Lights. Um, in in my world, it's also like the year that uh, Jay DeFeo and Wally Hedrick get married, um, and um, and so Jay and Wally were the last ones to leave uh, the building that I write about, 2322 Fillmore Street. Um, in 1965, and so so it forms sort of a, a nice framework for me. Um, I love this picture too of of Frill and Getty inside City Lights. Um, I am the door, uh, formerly a Holy Rollers Church, um, so I had to include that one. Um, let's see. Sorry, technical difficulty here of like there. Um, this is just uh, images of um, gallery announcements um, from some of the galleries that were in the neighborhood of um, 2322 Fillmore Street, which is uh, Painterland. Michael McClure dubbed it Painterland. And um, I think this. Um, quote by Alfred Frankenstein, uh, <clears throat> Frankenstein in um, San Francisco Chronicle, 1954, um, represents both the, um, the tenor of um, city lights and of uh, so, sort of burgeoning gallery and music scenes. Um, no self-respecting art community is ever complete without a small informal gallery run by artists themselves and dedicated to emerging talent and experimental ideas. These galleries seldom last forever, but the idea behind them never dies. Many of the things they display are half-baked and scarcely survive their initial exposure. On the other hand, some of the most important people in the history of art have been introduced to the public by ventures of this kind. So we're thinking about Batman Gallery, Six Gallery, Spatza, um, a lot of these uh, um, Ubu gallery, these sort of um, artist run experimental spaces where um, a lot of the artists um, that Peter was just mentioning who um, intersected and cross pollinated with city lights um, were just getting their first opportunities um, to show and, and experiment on a broader stage. Um, the Sixth Gallery uh, famously um, opened on uh, in 1954. Uh, it was called the Six uh, because it was started by um, six artists and poets: Wally Hedrick, Hayward King, Deborah Remington, John Ryan, David Simpson, and Jack Spicer. They took over the space that was briefly occupied by King Ubu. 
um, uh, Jess and Duncan's Endeavor, a former car repair shop, also on Fillmore Street. Um, and this is where um, one year later, Allen Ginsberg reads his poem, Howl, uh, the famous um, reading of Howl at the Sixth Gallery. And um, it sets off um, <clears throat> sort of shockwaves, um, as we know, uh, both in the literary world and the art world and at City Lights uh, in particular. Um, Ferlinghetti was in the audience that night and the next day um, he telegrammed Allen Ginsberg saying, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. When do I get the manuscript? Um, and uh, subsequently published Howell and other poems, um, which led to um, obscenity charges, as we know, and a trial in 1957. Um, here I have two, uh, um, a great picture, I think, of uh, the poet Michael McClure um, reading Howell. Um, McClure helped to organize that night at the Sixth Gallery. And, um, and kept uh, extensive journals, which are housed at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And in those journals, he recorded uh, his experience of that night, um, being at the Sixth Gallery, hearing Ginsburg read Howell, um, and, uh, um, and uh, his enthusiasm is un unmistakable. Um, the subject of my book, Welcome to Painterland, um, is literally um, this building pictured here. Um, <clears throat> here we see Jay DeFeo uh, standing outside um, on the fire escape watching as the movers move her painting The Rose out of the bay window. Um, Michael McClure dubbed this four unit building, 2322 Fillmore Street Painterland. Uh, when they moved in, he and his wife Joanna moved in in 1956 because it became um, not only a popular meeting place for artists, poets, and musicians, but also um, the homes of uh, many of these folks. Uh, so Joan Brown and William Brown, Jay DeFeo and Wally Hedrick, um, Michael McClure and Joanna McClure were some of the first ones who lived there. Um, they cut the walls down between the apartments um, so that they could uh, move more easily between each other's homes. Um, James Kelly, Sonia Getchoff, um, Craig Kaufman, Jim Newman, David Getz, um, all these folks um, came and went um, as, as residents of this building. Um, Bruce Connor and his wife, Jean Connor, lived around the corner. And um, Bruce, uh, Bruce and Jean moved there in, um, well, first, they actually, they actually, when they first moved to San Francisco, the day they married, they moved to San Francisco in September of 1957, and they stayed with Jean, I mean, they stayed with Joanna McClure and Michael McClure. Um, and then they moved uh, to an apartment around the corner in 1958. And um, Bruce really wanted to sort of solidify his relationship uh, to this um, cast of characters living at 23, 20 to Fillmore. And so he uh, started a group called the Rat Bastard Protective Association. Um, so that was early 1958. He sent letters out to everyone he wanted to um, be members of his group, everyone he wanted to be friends with, who he wanted to have an artistic dialogue with, and um, just um, told them that they were members of the organization and um, that they owed him dues and that they were gonna have meetings um, every three weeks at a different person's house. And so that was 1958 and, um, <clears throat> and their collaborations and their friendships um, lasted um, for, in some instances, um, a lifetime. Here are, um, just a few pictures of some of the key players, uh, Wally Hedrick, Michael McClure again, Manuel Neary, Joan Brown, Jean Connor, Jay DeFeo, and Carlos Villa. 
Carlos Villa was the youngest uh, <clears throat> of the uh, Rat Bastard Protective Association members. And um, I had a chance to interview him um, and he was very proud of having been invited uh, by Bruce himself um, to uh, to be part of their 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 loose affiliation, their group. Um, in 1958, uh, Fred Martin, the artist Fred Martin, um, asked Jerry Burchard, uh, who was a young student at the California School of the Arts at the time, um, to take photographs of the artists living and working at 2322 Fillmore, um, and uh, and Jerry Burchard did this and. Um, we're just so lucky uh, to have such extensive documentation <clears throat> of um, the, um, you know, the day-to-day -day life, essentially, of the artists um, and poets living and working here at this time. Um, so um, that was one of my great discoveries when I was writing uh, Welcome to Painterland. Um, I <clears throat> discovered that um, the photographer Dennis Hearn um, had gone into Jerry's studio after Jerry passed in 2012. And um, Jerry didn't have, um, he has one nephew. Um, and so Dennis just took the contents of Jerry's studio and brought it to his studio. And when I met Dennis, his studio was just filled to the ceiling with banker boxes full of um, rolls of, of negative film and contact sheets and printed photographs and um, it was just really a treasure trove. And um, it's a pretty extensive archive. Uh, I zeroed in on these um, paint, these photographs he took of um, artists living at 2322 Fillmore. Um, <clears throat> here's Jay working on the rose in the front um, um, bay window of that building, Wally Hedrick. Jay, um, Wally uh, famously liked to uh, to host parties and uh, he made his own beer. Um, here's Bruce Connor, portraits by Jerry Burchard, uh, Connor in his studio. Um, this is Jay at 2322 Fillmore. Um, Manuel Neary. Jay DeFeo and Joan Brown. <clears throat> um, I'm including these just, you know, because it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful moment capturing uh, Joan Brown mm -hmm. dancing, uh, David Park on piano, Douglas McKaggy on drums, Elmer Bischoff on trumpet, Wallace, Wally Hedrick on banjo <laughs> at the California School of Fine Arts. Just like, this wonderful moment. Um, <clears throat> so as I was saying earlier, the um, when Lawrence Fern Gutty was arrested on obscenity charges um, for, for Ginsburg's Howell, um, most uh, narratives of the beats um, sort of take that as the starting point, the reading of Howell and then um, the arrest and um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think tour buses started stopping at City Lights around that time. And um, and um, so one of the one of the stories um, that I don't know if I don't know if it really passes for like serious intersection of City Lights and the artistic community, but I think so. Um, Wally Hedrick was enlisted um, to wear a uh, beret. Uh, a beard, a turtleneck, and sandals, um, and sit in the window at Vesuvio's um, for the tour buses so that they would see an authentic beat. Um, and this is uh, this is Wally without beard, turtleneck, <coughs> and beret um, working on his sculptures in the courtyard at California School of Fine Arts. Um, in 1963, Ferlin Getty begins publication of City Lights Journal, and um, he dedicates the first issue to William Carlos Wind Williams and Ezra Pound, and uh, it includes artwork by Bruce Connor. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a terrific photo of Connor in his studio, and um, 
Um, by all indications, Connor also really loved this photo. Um, he had an exhibition at the Dallas Museum of Arts in the 70s, and he, in, he made a huge poster of this photograph uh, to advertise that exhibition. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to end with um, this great photograph of Ferlin Getty and uh, his wife and um, their dog from 1959. Um, in the course of my research, <clears throat> um, I just really enjoyed uh, doing a deep dive, mostly in the Bancroft Library at Berkeley's archives, and um, just found um, so many gems, so many, so many great uh, photographs that I hadn't seen before, and archives that I hadn't, I don't know, have gotten much exposure yet. So that's one of the one of the pleasures of of writing and research. Thank you. So, well, thank you, Anastasia. Um, I would like to bring Laura Whitcomb into our discussion now. Laura, I'd, I'd like you to talk about the Delexi just down the street from City Lights and and the importance of its connection and linkage to, to City Lights. I mean, I, I personally grew up with Dan Newman, whose father, Jim Newman, ran the Delexi and also produced the Sun Ra film. And growing up, I, I drew connections between the music scene and City Lights. And of course, the you know, jazz section at City Lights was something that, you know, made a huge impression on me as a teenager. But there was also the Mabuhe Gardens, which was the very first punk rock club to really emerge in the city, not far from the Delexi, where I might mention that Sun Ra also performed. And I want to talk about the importance of all these linkages and 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 also the San Francisco Art Institute's connection to all this. Yes, there's a, a, a broad terrain to discuss. And firstly, I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this very compelling panel um, with um, people I all individually would love to have coffee with because we have a great deal in common and much to discuss. Um, I'd firstly like to say, say that what really drew me to Ferlinghetti was I think his exceptional position in American culture is that he embodied such a, a broad experience in the human condition. He had, um, as we've heard in this discussion, a, a very trying childhood. And he also had um, been involved in World War II. Um, and although he was uh, on a submarine chaser, he didn't go into combat per se, but when he was in Japan um, after the war, um, after the bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he actually took his leave to go to Nagasaki to see just the corrosive horror of what war was. And for somebody to just immerse themselves in one of the most just unprecedented, unprecedented horrors in human history and embody that for his mission of what he was going to bring to the rest of the world to resolve um, never seeing a crisis like that ever occur, really um, came through in his, his passion and, and his, his foundation with uh, City Lights. And I think when he began this with Peter D. Martin, uh, he had access through Peter D. Martin's uh, wife at the time, Madeline um, D. Mont Martin, who was at the California School of Fine Art. And she was studying with many of the GIs that had been in the war that were on the GI Bill, Jack Jefferson, John Grillo, Frank Lobdell, who had st stumbled upon one of like the worst massacres at Gardelligan um, in Germany. And, and he and Ernie Briggs, another artist, he was on the GI Bill at the CSFA, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute. These um, were, they had almost like a compatriot um, uh, connection in that they had all experienced horror and understood that abstract expressionism was a way to convey the lost language that could consolidate um, and heal the traumas of these wounds. And just as much as he was passionate as, as an artist and as, a, as an editor for Art Digest, 
he really uh, wanted to bring um, to to the table um, the 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 convergence of 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 jazz and and abex and gestural painting, and that was very easy for him because. Uh, the jazz workshop was right down the street and above the jazz workshop was the Delexi. So you have the jazz, um, the jazz cellar, you have like the coffee gallery, you have all these places um, in, in North Beach and the Fillmore bringing this convergence and this, this, this like-minded need to create this utopia, that this yearning for a utopia. So I, I find it um, very important that um, Basically, Lawrence was um, experiencing a lot of these, these uh, convergences. Lewis Watts had shown these amazing photos of Jimbo's Bop City. Jimbo's Bop City, um, th those murals that you see in the background, those cosmological figures are, are Harry Smith. And I yes. hope um, Harry Smith um, has a, a really important show at the Whitney. I, I just saw it in New York. And, and what... Um, he was trying to do is, is he was trying to create notations of the corresponding rhythms of uh, a universal synergistic connection between like Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie. And, and, and this is really showing what San Francisco uniquely was bringing to the table is this convergence of a, of a mysticism and, and, um, and, and, and that, that is, that is seeing in both, in both avenues. So eventually, um uh Lawrence went uh brought in some of the artists into City Lights itself. Uh Jordan Belson did the, the frontage of of um of of City Lights and Jordan Belson was a really important filmmaker. He uh he worked on the Vortex with Harry Jacobs and uh also, um, a man named Robert Levine, who's been completely lost to history. Robert Levine was uh, a, a painter that did portraits of many of the, the beat artists and, and poets, but he had showcased at City Lights of a portrait of, of Peter Orlovsky. And who should walk in to see this portrait of this very handsome Peter Orlovsky is Allen Ginsberg. And Allen Ginsberg fell in love. Um, it was also Robert Levine's boyfriend, um, Peter Olasky. So he kind of disappeared for the scene and, and has been relatively lost to history. But Lawrence just really offered City Lights to just portray some of these incredible artists that were so important that just kind of got swapped under the rug. Um, there is, there's Ted Jones and Arthur Monroe. Arthur Monroe was um, an African-American artist um, that was an absolutely brilliant human being um, who has passed away with, without um, a, enough, enough exposure. And um, yes, and even Jean Connor, Bruce Connor's wife had, had shown and, and naturally th this was happening at a time where so many of the, there were alternative spaces of which my, um, my next book will cover. Uh, Anastasia has um, brilliantly covered um, the, the the Batman and the Spatsa uh, and and everything at twenty three twenty two on Fillmore, uh, uh, just a vital source for for scholars like myself. But um, the book that I am working on and have been working on for the last ten years uh, focuses on Ubu, the Six Gallery, Med Art, which was started by um, Clifford Still students that were at the San Francisco Art Institute or the CSFA, which it was called at the time. Um, the, the Vallejo boat, which um, uh, 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 Jean Verda, who taught at the CSFA, um, Alan Watts later lived there. And also it was shared by the surrealist artist, Gordon Onslow Ford. Uh, the Vallejo boat showed amazing um, uh, exhibitions. Ruth Asawa had one of her first shows there. There were so many um, just alternative spaces in San Francisco that were mainly bars. Like I said, the the the, the jazz cellar. There was Vesuvio, where um, Wally Hedrick famously did his beat impresario in the window. 
Um, again, um, there was a, a lot of galleries that have never really made it to the record. There was uh, a gallery called the New Mission, Beauregard's, which was um, uh, Ebba Beauregard, the Poets Gallery, where you could see shows of, of Jess and, and hear lectures by Robert Duncan. Um, the Peacock Gallery, the, the, these catered to the LGBTQ plus scene that was um, very uh, vital to this, this greater cohesive um, landscape. So, um, but yeah, I think what's really exciting about San Francisco is there's this incredible history of not just dissent, but this almost Dada-based love of absurdism. And Peter um, delightfully asked me to speak uh, about the Mabuhe and how that might kind of connect to so much of the spirit that um, developed through the years. Uh, the Mabuhe had a man named Dirk Dirksen who uh, was the MC and he was like Lenny Bruce on steroids. And I think, um, I think what's so interesting about comparing um, the, the punk scene of, of, of San Francisco to Los Angeles or New York is it, it really had that sort of absurdism element happening that was that made it so charged. And I think that's what really brought Bruce Connor to be such a vital documentarian of that period. You had the bands like the Avengers, the Nuns, Negative Trends, the Situations, or they all had these very kind of easy to remember names, Crime, the Mutants, but um, but also, of course, they were showing uh, experimental music like, like Sun Ra. And that um, also just shows this, this ever progressive um, cohesion that was offered in San Francisco through uh, experimental music. And that, that really, to get to your first question, Peter, is to get to the essence of what the Delexi was. The Delexi was about merging um, filmmakers with new ideologies in, in, in the arts um, and painting and sculpture and, and experimental music particularly. Uh, Jim Newman, of course, he allied with Walter Hopps during the concert hall workshop. I'm not gonna talk about that because we are doing something, we hope, with Stanford. But um, what, what I could talk about is um, his uh, very productive alliances with the San Francisco Tape Music um, Center, uh, which was founded by Roman Sender and, and, and Morton Subotnik. And they actually um, did happenings across the city and, and hosted Terry Riley's first minimal um, performance of In C. So these, it's, it's everything that really um, impacted uh, the East Coast eventually all percolated in the Bay Area. And I think Lawrence Ferlinghetti really was a great host to en encourage and enable so much that I think it'll take decades to really unravel everything that he accomplished. But, um, but, but certainly it is um, a fascinating pe period. And I'm, I'm so grateful that the universe guided me to this area of scholarship and it's just so wonderful to participate with um, equally passionate um, and like-minded folks that are, are, that are continuing this story. So Laura, if we could talk a little bit about the San Francisco Art Institute. Thank you, thank you. I, I shall not leave that there. Um, of course, uh, uh, I believe uh, City Lights' connection to the San Francisco Art Institute really began with um, uh, Madeline Demond, um, and uh, who is um, Peter's uh, Peter Martin's wife, who was studying. And I and I believe the, the I mean, uh, even with with Lawrence living in the same building that was handed over by Hazel Smith and Hazel Smith. I mean, generally, a, th a thing that's very important is that um, Vesuvio's and City Lights are right next to each other. So basically, City Lights, uh, um, it was, the, you know, the interchange of interest between the libations you would have at Vesuvio's and then, you know, stumbling in to um, read the books at City Lights and have like the the groundbreaking conversations. I mean, that circularity is what really um enabled so many of the students of the, of the Art Institute to really escalate. So it is um, incredibly in important. 
um, I, and it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, um, I mean, the, so many of, of the prep, the, the students and the professors that are, um, that, that worked at City Lights, I mean, it's, there's, there is so much crossover. Um, if there's anything particularly, cause it's a, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's a broad subject. I'd be happy to pinpoint one thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an extremely deep rabbit hole because, you know, you have so many different parts of the art scene and the literary scene all kind of converging. I mean, you had Kathy Acker, who yes. we'd see on a regular basis, who used to shop at City Lights. You have Mark Pauline, who was with Survival Research Laboratories, who was teaching a class at the Art Institute. But then, you know, City Lights publishes Karen Finley. I mean, you know, there, there's just like you say, there, there's so many deep rabbit holes that, that kind of connect to SFAI. Yeah, especially with punk and like um, many of the bands, like they, I think um, were at, of course, at the at the Art Institute. And the Art Institute was hosting incredible shows, um, and actually, Jim Newman saw Sun Ra for the first time at the Art Institute. The Art Institute was um, would do just happenings in the '60s with the music of Warner Jepsen. It was and the the events that took place at at the Art Institute um, were just uh, were equally groundbreaking and and but also I, I did forget to mention V Vale who I think is one of the most important um, figures in this whole narrative because uh, I wasn't old enough to be at um, the Mabuhe <laughs> I was only 10 um, but um, I came to learn about V Vale through uh, the Amok bookstore here in Los Angeles and and research was hugely um uh fulfilling to 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 my interests at, at, as a teenager and i think um as as a documentarian and somebody who was city lights family that's a real that's also a really important um scope of interest that should be pursued yeah and if i can add you know city lights really was a place where and people have to understand you know th there was no internet there were no cell phones the way that you learned about things was picking up newspapers and picking up journals and Search and Destroy or Slash Magazine or No From New York. City Lights was one of the first places in San Francisco where you could pick up these journals. And then there was also a free, um, it was just a 11 by, eight and a half by 11 printout that this woman, Ivy, who was part of the punk scene, used to produce. And she would do this monthly and it would be a calendar with all kinds of cutout graphics that were, you know, sort of ransom like graphics and very data like. And it would be a calendar of film, of music, uh, of strange happenings. There was a lot of fluxus influence and mail art influence in it. And it was the place where I, as a teenager, I would come to City Lights looking for that that giveaway which would be placed in with the magazines and that's how i would learn about a lot of these shows and as you mentioned like you know one of my first punk rock shows was actually not at mabuhe it was actually at the san francisco art institute and it was the band the avengers and penelope houston their lead singer was actually a student at the art institute and that's actually how the whole thing you know kind of happened but penelope was also really close friends with this man mindy bagden who was an employee at city lights and who produced the very, very first punk rock movie called Louder, Faster, Shorter. So if I can kind of maybe begin to sort of wrap things up, I mean, I, I think for, for me, curiosity, I think receptivity, I think a sense of wonder, which for Linghetti and I think with Shig Morale and, and since then many of the staff, it's something that's really lent itself and it really helped us connect, you know, to these different scenes. And uh, and that's what's really kind of made a difference. Uh, I think what I can do now is maybe bring all of you into this discussion and, you know, any comments, any thoughts as we've been moving along tonight, what is this sort of evoked for all of you? And anybody jump in at this point. Well, Peter, let me just say I am grateful 
to all the people on this panel tonight. You know, I've learned so much and it's been such kind of an illuminating and I've worked at City Lights since 1970. And so just to have these, all these various corners that I'm just, that I've been so closely associated has been such a marvelous journey for me tonight. So I thank you all uh, for kind of an astounding, astounding couple hours. So. And I'm hoping at some future that we can all gather together and, and continue this conversation. So, and Peter, thank you for convening us. Sure. Here, here. We we need to all have a, a drink together at some point. <laughs> yes. And John Bug, when is your book coming out? Now we must read it. Um, I'll I'll keep you posted, but it's um maybe summer 25. Um okay. yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be a big party for that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And Lewis, please stay in contact with us and kind of like, you know, what's what, what your work in general, but in particularly with Harlem of the West and what we're going to see for a new edition. I will do that. And I think I definitely got my eye on City Lights as a, as a source for getting the word out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank all of you for contributing to this really amazing program. I mean, ever grateful to you that we could all explore this important side of City Lights together. I uh, also want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us tonight and for having an interest in what makes City Lights, City Lights. Tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So goodbye, everyone. Please take care. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Happy seventh. Okay. Yes. It's your pleasure. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank